Good morning, John Marshall. Please be seated. At this time, as a courtesy to others, we ask that all cell phones be put away. Welcome to John Marshall. I'm Private First Class Josh Ranfrans. I'm speaking to you today as a proud American soldier. I'm Sammy Getter, a recent and proud enlistee with the Minnesota Army National Guard. And I'm Morgan Salmon, the proud sister of an American soldier. We are here to welcome everyone to John Marshall's 2018 Salute to Veterans. Let's give it up for the always amazing JM Band and its military medley led by Mr. John Soderberg Chase. This morning, we have the special honor of looting John Marshall and its guests in our annual tribute to veterans. Every November 11th, across the United States, Americans observe a day set aside by Congress to, to honor our military veterans for their service to and sacrifices for our country. Before we proceed with our Salute to Veterans program, we would like to give a warm rocket welcome to our many special guests here with us today. Veterans, active duty military, reserve, Reserve Officer Training Corps, and National Guard members, many of whom are John Marshall graduates. We are so glad you are here. Welcome. In the time-honored tradition where all military veterans are recognized, a military honor guard posts the colors. Today's Rochester Own Military Honor Guard from the Veterans of Foreign Wars post 1215 will present the American flag. Please rise for the flag presentation. Staff Sergeant Rachel Thomas, a 2012 graduate of John Marshall High School, will now call the roll and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Class of 1993. Please 
join me in presenting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. The JM Choir, led by Mr. Ryan Evans, will now lead us in singing the national anthem. Thank you, VFW Post 1215, Staff Sergeant Thomas, JM Alumni Military Guests, and JM Choir. You may now be seated. Throughout our program today, we will continue our rocket tradition of featuring JM grads currently serving in the military as our guest speakers here and in video postcards. Let's start with this message, recorded especially for John Marshall late last May at Soldiers Field Memorial by our 2018 rocket graduates who have chosen to serve, some of whom are here with us today as American service men and women. Hello, John Marshall, and welcome to the 2018 Salute to Veterans program. My name is Teresa Peterson, and I am one of 10 members of the graduating class of 2018 who have chosen to enlist in a branch of the United States military before our graduation day. We are standing here at Soldiers Field Veterans Memorial as it symbolizes the commitment we each feel for our country. The Department of Veteran Affairs says that nearly 42 million Americans have served the United States military throughout history. Although that's true, less than 1% of Americans have volunteered to serve our nation. Selfless service is one of the core values for all branches of the United States military. American soldiers put the safety of our nation, the military, and fellow soldiers love their own safety every day. We are all committed to doing this with integrity, honor, courage, loyalty, and excellence. Veterans Day is the day set aside by Congress to thank and honor all who have served honorably in the military in wartime and in peacetime. It is also time to recognize the sacrifices each soldier and those who love them make on our behalf. Each of us has chosen to commit to a branch of the United States military. We are now proudly joining more than 500 John Marshall graduates who have served and continue to serve in the United States Air Force, Army, Army National, National Guard, the United States Army. Thank you for continuing to honor and remember our country's veterans. Go Roll Rockets! Roll out.
Today we come together to acknowledge and honor the men and women who have stepped up to protect and defend our country and therefore each of us here today. They stand for us. They take our place on the line and assume great personal risks. They do this freely and sometimes they give their very lives by following this code. Service before self. Although each American soldier serves for his or her own personal reasons, they also serve to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. A vow to protect the ideals, laws, and individual rights and freedoms upon which America is founded. Today's program is all about service before self. We pay special tribute to all American veterans and active duty military who put the needs of others and their country before themselves. It is with great pleasure then that I welcome home to John Marshall, Staff Sergeant Rachel Thomas. A 2012 John Marshall graduate, while a student here at JM, she played in the band and is a member of our awesome drumline. She loved football games, homecoming week, and was even a member of the Harry Potter Club. Some of her favorite classes were sports bio and environmental awareness because, as she puts it, those classes gave her skills which pre prepared her for life after high school. Following her time here at JM, Staff Sergeant Thomas attended Air Force Basic Military Training in November of 2012 and in 2016 earned an associate's degree in criminal justice. She was most recently working as a reports and analysis technician at the Eglin Air Force Base in Florida where she processed criminal incident reports and coordinated the filing of criminal records. She's here with us today to share her thoughts regarding Veterans Day and what it means to her. Please give a loud rocket welcome to Staff Sergeant Rachel Thomas. Good morning. My name is Staff Sergeant Rachel Thomas and I served six years in the United States Air Force. I graduated from John Marshall back in 2012 and joined the military a few months later. The past six years have been some of the best years of my life. I was stationed in different parts of the country, was able to get unique training, and earn my criminal justice degree. Five years ago, I met my husband while stationed in New Mexico, and we now have two amazing kids. I would join the military all over again in a heartbeat because it was such a great experience and taught me many life lessons. Being in the military isn't always glamorous. It can be a lot of long hour days, lifelong mental health issues, and a lot of ibuprofen. It takes a brave person to be willing to lay down their life for their country. Veterans Day holds a special place in my heart because not only am I a veteran, but it's the exact day that I joined the Air Force six years ago, and this Veterans Day marks my last day as active duty military. I know so many amazing men and women that have served this country to include my husband, my father, and my grandfather. Every veteran has a unique connection to each other because you know you can trust them with your life. When I see a veteran, I see someone who has patriotism, professionalism, and integrity. Veterans Day is to honor the men and women who have served in the United States military. Many people don't realize the historical significance behind Veterans Day. It was orig originated as Armistice Day and marked the end of hostilities of World War I that occurred on the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month. Armistice Day was originally to honor the fallen but was later expanded to recognize all veterans. This Veterans Day marks the 100th anniversary to the end of the World War I and the beginning of Armistice Day. Veterans Day is to honor all the men and women who have sacrificed their lives to protect our families, our way of life, and the Constitution of the United States. This Veterans Day, I challenge you to not treat it like any other day, but instead go out of your way to recognize every veteran in your life and remember all the sacrifices they have made. Thank you. Thank you, Staff Sergeant Thomas, for spending time with us, your Rocket family, and for sharing your remarks and your service. Okay, JM family, it's time for another video postcard. This comes to us from First Lieutenant Spencer Johnson and Cadet Sawyer Johnson. Spencer and Sawyer Johnson are both proud John Marshall graduates. Both are serving our country as members of the United States military. 
Spencer is a first lieutenant in the United States Air Force, and Sawyer is a senior cadet at the United States Military Academy, West Point. Sawyer will graduate and be commissioned as second lieutenant in the United States Army this spring. The Johnson brothers grew up in Rochester, attended Washington Elementary and John Adams Middle School. They played football and were star swimmers on the JM swim team. Sawyer was also on student council and was very involved in the first three years of the Salute to Veterans program. They were both 4.0 students earning honors diplomas. In 2012, Spencer competed for a slot at the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, Colorado. He wanted a top-notch aerospace engineering program with all the academic, physical, and mental challenges of a military academy education. Ten days after high school graduation, he headed to the Air Force Academy for a summer of military training before starting college classes in the fall. First Lieutenant Johnson graduated from the Air Force Academy in 2016 and trained for a year as a pilot and as an RPA, Remote Piloted Aircraft Specialist. Today, Lieutenant Johnson is based in Las Vegas, Nevada at Creech Air Force Base. Sawyer Johnson graduated from JM in 2014 and headed to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the U.S. Army Reserve Officer Training Program, ROTC. Sawyer loved college life at Madison and the challenges Army ROTC provided, but he wanted more. He applied to the United States Military Academy, West Point, was accepted, and in June 2015, entered our country's oldest and most prestigious military academy. This May, he will graduate with a double major in electrical engineering and world politics and be commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Both Johnson brothers are fiercely proud of their military service branch, as are most U.S. military members. Competition is strong on one branches. Everyone is sure that their branch is the best. You'll hear some of this competitive spirit in a lighthearted way in the Johnson brothers' video postcard. Hey, John Marshall. This is Cadet Lieutenant Sora Johnson. 2014 graduate of John Marshall. In 2015, I reported to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Over the past three years, I have studied electrical engineering, world politics, and unit tactics. I'll find out my Army basic branch on 14 November. Like my brother said, the people you meet in the military are by far the best part of the job. We do really appreciate the time you take to honor those who have served and those who are serving. But what my brother said was false. I don't need to lie to you about which branch is better. Wars are won on the ground, in the mud, where most people won't go. But that's where the Army goes. But we do really appreciate the free airfare on the way over there. Go Army! Thanks to attend. Thanks to both Lieutenant Spencer Johnson and Cadet Sawyer Johnson for their commitment to our country. And we send special congratulations to Spencer on his wedding day last Saturday. Let's give the Johnson brothers a huge round of applause to show our support. One of our goals today is to show how U.S. servicemen, women, and veterans go above and beyond their military duties and put service before self. They show us how to walk the walk of someone who actually puts others first, even when it means making a personal sacrifice. A group of veterans out west have banded together to form a group known as Team Rubicon. Their name is unique and hints at their dedication to duty. A Rubicon is a line in one's life that when crossed, commits one to a course of action. For those who choose to serve, the moment of joining the military and taking the oath to serve is their Rubicon. From the perspective of those veterans who are part of Team Rubicon, no longer being on active duty makes no difference when it comes to helping others in need. They are still fully committed to the ideals of service before self, even as veterans. According to Team Rubicon's website, their overall mission is to unite the skills and experiences of military veterans with first responders to rapidly deploy emergency response, response teams. Let's take a brief look at what Team Rubicon is all about. I want to tell you a story. The story of a group of people. 
a group of people with an impulse. An impulse that was a call to serve. And that service filled a need and bridged a gap. Swift-footed, mobile, adaptable, they treated countless victims. They saved lives. They banded together and served in remote locations, locations some dared not go. But then they found that there was also a need at home. And that need was also tangible and immediate. One tornado, one hurricane after another, and more destruction than they had the resources or manpower to respond to. So, they recruited, and that call was answered. Thousands of volunteers answered, on standby for each disaster, hoping to be deployed, given a t-shirt, maybe a cot to sleep on, a hot meal at the end of the day, given a mission, a purpose. And they found that they were healing more than the wounds of a storm. They were also healing the wounds of a war. A war that forged a brotherhood and sisterhood. A war that instilled in them certain skills. A war that would forever change their perspective. A war that they would leave, but that would never leave them. Some were lost. Some were lost here at home. Every day, lives are lost here. But the call continues to go out. For they did not stop serving when they took off the uniform. They merely traded in that uniform for one with a symbol, a symbol with a river running through it, a symbol of a gap, of a challenge, a challenge that they must adapt to, be pliable to, and stay a step ahead of, and a call that must be answered, to serve again, to put others before oneself, to manage volunteers, to set an example, to do simple good, to bring order to chaos, to give relief, to give comfort, to give hope to others and to themselves. We've crossed the Rubicon. Now, we burn the boat. The team has recently been focusing its efforts on areas of our country impacted by natural disasters, from fires out west to hurricanes on the eastern seaboard and in the Gulf. If you've seen it on the news in the past five months, they've sent veterans to help. Thanks to groups like Team Rubicon, U.S. veterans are still finding ways to put the needs of others first as they volunteer to help wherever help is needed. Before introducing you to our keynote speaker, we would like to take a moment of time to honor a uh, JM staff member here who has served in our military. JM industrial tech teacher, Dr. Greg Olson, served in the United States Army during the 1970s. In 2014, Dr. Olson was named the VFW Teacher of the Year and was presented with this prestigious award by Governor Dayton. He currently serves in leadership roles for veterans groups in the area. Thank you so much for your service. We are very proud to have you here at JM. We would now like to recognize all members of the military who are here today as our guests. If you are a member of the United States military or a military veteran, will you please stand? Thank you for your service. One part of honoring military veterans includes recognizing all the people who are doing what is commonly called secondary enlistment. When, you, when someone you know or love serves our country, it often feels like you're serving right along with them. This includes family, friends, neighbors, employers, coworkers. Many lives are impacted and altered while that soldier's deployed. So let's see how secondary enlistment works out this year at JM. Please listen carefully. Would those of you in the audience please stand if you know someone who is active duty, 
currently deployed, or has served in the U.S. military. Now look around. Isn't it amazing how many people in our school are connected to the U.S. military? Please recognize and honor classmates and friends. You may now be seated. At this time, we would like to invite former teacher and coach here at JM, Mr. Dave Kennenberg, to introduce today's keynote speaker. Let's hear it for Coach Kennenberg. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much, Sammy, John Marshall, for that warm welcome. It's great to be back, see my JM family, and see so many great friends again. As the son of a Vietnam veteran and a Purple Heart recipient, I am also always reminded of how important this assembly is and why we do it. Today I'm especially excited to be back here at JM because I've been asked to introduce Colonel Scott Heathman, a 1993 JM grad who is a teammate of mine in football and in baseball, as well as a good friend of mine throughout high school, despite being one class ahead of me. When Scott Heathman graduated from John Marshall High School, he went on to attend the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering, as well as his commission through Reserve Officer Training Corps in 1997. From there, he continued his education and his military training, following a path which would ultimately lead him to become Colonel Heathman, the Vice Commander of the 92nd Air Refueling Wing, located at Fairchild Air Force Base in Washington State. Some of his prior accomplishments include three master's degrees, one in National Security and Strategic Studies from the College of Naval Warfare in Newport, Rhode Island. Prior to his current command, he served as Division Chief Senior Lead Management and Commander of the 64th Air Refueling Squadron at Pease Air National Guard Base in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Currently, he is with the 92nd Air Refueling Wing in Washington, providing the United States military with global air power and deploys expeditionary forces in support of worldwide combat, contingency, and humanitarian support including such things as medical evacuations. As vice commander, he is also responsible for the activities and functions on Fairchild Air Force Base and provides support for 19 units. And now, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce my friend, Mr. Colonel Scott Heathman. This is the toughest crowd I've ever had to speak in front of. I'll, I'll let you know that right up front. So good morning, John Marshall. I'm thrilled to be back here. Uh, it's nice to know that the auditorium hasn't changed, but the rest of the school has changed quite a bit. Uh, I recognize I maybe have fallen asleep a couple times in the back there, uh, but uh, it is really good to be back. Dave, thank you for that introduction. I'm not sure who gave you all those words, but uh, I would have been happy with a, hey, Scott, what's up? But uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, yeah, Dave and I go back a, a little bit, and uh, we I obviously went to school here together, played some sports together. Um, you know, that picture of me in that football uniform, you'd think I was this monstrous linebacker, uh, but as a senior in high school, I think on a good morning, I was five foot one and 135 pounds. Uh, so not exactly the rock, and probably smaller than Rudy Rudiger, who played for Notre Dame, and uh, a funny story, uh, I'll divert here for a second. Uh, my senior year, we, we had a pretty good team, and you guys had an even more phenomenal team in 93. Uh, we went undefeated both in 92, I think, and in 93. Um, and it was about seven, seven games into the season. And uh, because I'm not an athlete like Dave over here, I'm, I'm kind of a mediocre football player at best at five foot one, 135 pounds. But if you did read the program, it said that I was five foot six, 165 pounds. Uh, you got to do whatever you can to get an edge, right? Uh, 
I can remember going up to Coach Snuffy Williams at the time, and I said, hey, Coach, I just want to start this one game. you got to put me in there. And, and uh, he looked me right square in the eye because we were the same height. And uh, he, uh, he said, uh, Scotty, he goes, let me tell you something. He goes, you are my nuclear weapon, and you don't ever, ever use your nuclear weapon. <laughs> so I'm still today not sure how to feel about that, about what he said. Uh, I think that was a compliment. I think he was probably trying to protect me. Uh, maybe my mom had something to do with that. Who knows? Uh, but uh, I'll never forget that. And, and no, I never did start. But, uh, uh, but we had some fun times and had some, uh, some good years of football. Uh, I, hey, I'd like to extend a, a, uh, a appreciation to Principal uh, Mr. Eric Johnson. And uh, I understand this is your first year. Uh, and I can tell you, you know, being first year in a leadership position, uh, I'm sure that you've experienced joy, uh, a little bit of stress, some ups and downs. Uh, but, but don't sweat it. I'm sure you're doing a phenomenal job. And uh, I appreciate, you know, what you're doing to spend time with students and going out of your way to, you know, maybe take a morning and have them meet up with you and listen to their concerns. So that, that means a lot to them as well. <laughs> to Ms. Brooks Sanchard, I, you've pulled off another phenomenal program. She's been trying to coax me to get here for a couple years. I think last year, if you were here, you saw the video postcard. I ended up deploying kind of last minute. Uh, I can't tell you where I went because I'd have to kill you if I did. But uh, uh, so I, I was thankful to get back this year. Um, you know, she asked, asked me about a year out. I said, hey, she said to me, hey, what are you doing next November? I'm like, I don't even know what I'm doing next week. So uh, I appreciate you staying uh, with me and, uh, and I'm really glad to be here. Uh, I've got some family and friends in the audience, too, uh, and it's, uh, I really appreciate the ride from the airport. It's a little bit of an Uber ride from Minneapolis, so I appreciate that. Uh, I've got a chance to go up to the Vikings game yesterday. Uh, i got to give a round of applause for that. So. I always say, uh, proudly, I was the only one wearing a New England Patriots jersey, but I had a lot of fans in the crowd as well as as we kind of took care of business of, with the Packers last night. So I know Minnesota's happy about that. So I was supporting both teams. Uh, and last but not least, you know, the real reason we're here, we're here to talk about veterans and, and service. And uh, I'm really honored to share this day with you all. Thank you, veterans. So what I've been told is that uh, I, if the longer I talk, the less school you have. So for the next two to three hours, I will spend a little bit of time with you, and uh, we'll make this a nice short school day for y'all. Are you okay with that? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so you gotta make friends quick, all right? This is stressful, this is a lot of stress up here. All right, so today's theme, we're talking about service. And, I, and I'd say to a veteran, service is something that's pretty obvious to us. I mean, we can point to it, We've been involved in, in uh, service as a profession, uh, and it's really easy to define. But what does it mean to the average citizen of the United States or to a student here at John Marshall? And that's what I'm going to want to spend a few minutes here talking to you about. And what I want you to walk away with is, a, is the idea that this little word that we call service is a little bit more of how you approach life. Uh, and I'll give you some tools, hopefully, that you can incorporate in your life for future success. So what is the word service mean to little Scotty Heathman? Well, that's me, by the way. Uh, that's what people call me. Um, service to me means a lot of things. I actually think about a lot of images in my head when I think of service. And, and I think about some of the things I did, uh, both as a student uh, in my college years and in the military. Um, and, and it's really all about serving others. It, you know, it is okay to have needs in your life and, and to take care of those personal needs. But what I want to challenge you on today is to try to find a way to put your needs to the side and start taking care of, spend a little time taking care of some of the other folks around you in your life. It may be friends, it may be a neighbor, or it may be someone that eventually you're going to work with. So when I hear the word service, I just want you to know that I'm not necessarily thinking about the men and women in uniform because I think service and serving is something that each and every one of us can do. And, and you do not need to take an oath to do that. It's something you can go out and do there today. And if you live a life that incorporates service on a regular basis, I think you're going to find the return on that investment to be tenfold. Throughout my years uh, in elementary school, all the way through college, I served my community as a 4-H member. 
Uh, my mom forced me to play piano at nursing homes uh, and uh, church. I, I did enjoy that. Uh, I served on uh, several student support committees here at John Marshall, like Teen Life Concerns, uh, just to give you an example, uh, and in combat. Uh, I've had uh, a lot of different uh, uh, jobs here in the county. I've served as a 4-H county ambassador and at the state level. Uh, and even, even toured some of the students on the south side of Chicago in some of the roughest neighborhoods uh, that surrounded our campus. Uh, I enjoyed every single one of those experiences, and it certainly shaped me uh, to be who I am today. And serving uh, sent me on the path, I think, for continued military success. So I want to tell you a little bit about that journey and what I've done uh, almost 22 years here in my uh, short career. Uh, I've had the privilege to fly uh, jet aircraft all my life. Um, I spent about a year of pilot training in southwest Texas, and then shortly thereafter I was stationed in Spokane, Washington at Fairchild Air Force Base. So this is actually the second time I've been stationed at Fairchild. Uh, I was there as a brand new lieutenant, and now I'm back there as a colonel, and it's a little bit like coming back into JM. You know, some things have changed, but, but there's a lot of things that are very, very familiar. Uh, at Fairchild Air Force Base, we fly the KC-135. And I'm not sure how many of you know what the KC-135 is, but it's a, uh, it's a Boeing 707 aircraft. Uh, our newest one is a 1963 model. Uh, the oldest one is a 57. So we're, we're talking 60 years old uh, with, with a hell of a group of maintainers that, that take great care of this aircraft. So what does it do? Well, it's, it's an, basically a flying gas can. Uh, we are an airborne gas station, and we refuel uh, all kinds of aircraft, not only just U.S. aircraft, but coalition aircraft. Um, and uh, air refueling is actually fairly simple. The plane just flies up right behind us. Once we get within about 15 or 20 feet, we connect, and then we hit some uh, pumps, and we start pumping fuel. So uh, I'm very proud to say that you're actually looking at a professional gas passer, okay? Uh, that, it's okay, you can laugh. It's all right. So I'm pretty good at passing gas, all right? That's all I'm going to say. Um, is it dangerous work? You bet it's dangerous. Uh, on the very first page of the Boeing owner's manual, the KC-135, the engineers wrote a very specific warning uh, to all air crew members of this aircraft. And I'll read it word for word here. It says, due to the interrelated aerodynamic effects, flying two aircraft in close vertical proximity is inherently dangerous. That's the first paragraph that I got to read when I was learning how to fly this airplane. Do you really think that instilled a lot of confidence in what I was about to do? Um, but it really is an amazing feat. It's a capability that, uh, that the United States uh, holds dearly. And uh, being in the tanker business is good business because our aircraft cannot get overseas without us. So you could probably think to yourselves, we're in pretty high demand. Um, during a typical air refueling, uh, we can pass anywhere between 1,000 pounds to 200,000 pounds of gas. We can carry up to 200,000 pounds. That's about 33,000 gallons or enough to run a, a, an F-150 for about 30 years, just in a single load, uh, a single tanker load. Um, and we can offload that pretty quick. Um, I've been on both the front end uh, in, in the tanker and actually have taken gas uh, as a receiver pilot. And I can tell you both sides, it, it is a... It is a stressful situation, but uh, hopefully air, both aircraft and both crew are nice and relaxed, and we can air refuel in night weather uh, and, and get to where we're going. And I tell you, there's nothing more joyful than seeing that tanker in the middle of the night over the ocean, knowing that you need gas from them and, and that you can get that on board quickly. It was during 9-11 that my services nation truly put that to the test. On the morning of 9-11, uh, of excuse me, my wife actually woke me up. She was uh, in Boston at the time. And uh, she said, hey, you need to turn on the TV. So we watched the, the events unfold. And after about an hour, I got a call from the base. And they said, hey, pack a bag. You need to come in. We're not sure how long you're going to be on base for. So I packed about two weeks' worth of clothes. Uh, they collect us all up. They made us into a crew. And they said, why don't you go over here to the dorms, and uh, we're going to get you on alert. And uh, basically, we, we sat on base for about two weeks, lived on base for two weeks and sat alert, uh, waiting to see if there are any potential follow-on attacks. Our job in that instance, and a few of us launched uh, right after 9-11, uh, was to get airborne as quickly as possible. And we were there to refuel the fighter jets that were out searching our coastline, or, uh, or actually flying over critical uh, infrastructure, such as uh, hydroelectric dams, nuclear power plants, 
anything like that, just in case somebody wanted to use that as a target. Over the years, I've sat, I've sat hundreds of hours of alert, uh, launched on occasion, occasion for real world threats like Russian bombers coming close to our, to our nation. Uh, I've even protected events such as the Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City uh, Olympic Games uh, or any type, type of presidential movement we had in the Northwest. Uh, you would be rest assured there was a tanker with a couple of F-15s or F-16s overhead making sure that uh, everything was good above. Even today, my wing stands alert to defend this great nation. And uh, our last uh, real alert that we had, uh, you might have read about it in the news, there was an Alaskan Airlines employee he, who decided to take an aircraft for a joyride, uh, took off out of Seattle, uh, got airborne. Well, our tanker launched, uh, so did two F-15s, and those F-15s pushed him off, off the coast to get him away from the populated areas, and, uh, and unfortunately, he uh, decided to crash it. So, but. Uh, um, the good thing is we had our forces there within a matter of minutes to make sure that this guy didn't do something crazy and, and come back into the populated areas. After about five years in the air refueling business, I applied for what's called a cross-flow program. And this is where you move from one aircraft to another. And in this chance, uh, in this opportunity, I, I got to fly the C-17, which is a big cargo plane. To give you a, a little idea of how big this plane is, I could take the first plane I was flying and fit it into the back of this plane. Uh, it is a massive cargo plane, and it's not even our largest in the Air Force inventory. But I've, I've carried everything from helicopters, tanks, and boats. I've personally airlifted troops, armored vehicles, special forces, the president's limos in support vehicles, key cabinet members such as the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. Yes, the USO tours do need to get transportation. And for the Army dig here, you're welcome for the free transportation. Um, <laughs> And I've also carried Martian spacecraft. I didn't take them all the, way, all the way to Mars. NASA did that, but I got them from Colorado to Cape Canaveral for launch. The C-17 on a good day, fully loaded, can weigh 600,000 pounds at max gross weight, and we can land in as little as 3,500 feet. Uh, so it's just over a half a mile. It's, it's truly an amazing aircraft. And believe me when I tell you this, it's 3,500 feet is a pretty short runway uh, when you're flying overhead Afghanistan in, in the middle of the night on night vision goggles and you're looking for a piece of dirt to land on. Um, but for its size, it, 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 it performs like a sports car and it's got a flight stick and a heads-up display. It's, it really is a, a quantum leap in technology from the 1950s era tanker that it flew to the 2000 era C-17. This aircraft took me all over the world to every continent except Antarctica. That's the one that has eluded me. Uh, but we do actually fly pretty routine basis missions down to Antarctica and we land on the ice runway down there. But some of the most memorable missions were taking wounded out of harm's way to hospitals so that they can receive the care that they needed to the next highest level. And I would tell you, if you talk to World War II veterans and ask them, um, you know, where a lot of our casualties came from, a lot of them were battlefield and they, the fact that they couldn't get to a hospital. Uh, there was probably about a 10% survival rate if you were shot or injured in combat. And today, you know, we're pretty proud to say that we've got over 90% survival rate because we can get you out of Iraq, Afghanistan, out of Syria, back to a, a critical care facility. And uh, we have incredible uh, air medical teams and doctors that can work on you while you're in the back of the airplane and we can get you stabilized and, and hopefully live a really good long life. So we're pretty proud of that. But after, like, like any good pilot, after a few years, uh, you're kind of forced into, uh, instead of flying an airplane, flying a desk. Uh, and, and I spent a few years in a staff job at the Pentagon where they'd asked me to uh, be the lead planner uh, to work on ending the war in Iraq in 20, uh, 2012. Uh, so I spent two years working on that uh, for the chairman and uh, spent a lot of my time at the State Department, got to work with a lot of great folks in our government and how do we, how do we end combat operations there uh, and, and move them more to a stability type, type environment. And unfortunately, like most things in the Middle East, peace in the Middle East is very complex and it's very tricky. And it was short-lived as ISIS reared its ugly head a couple years later. And today we still find ourselves, we still deploy several airmen to the Middle East uh, to, to engage with ISIS and other violent extremists in Iraq, Syria, and Northern Africa. Uh, but I can tell you their numbers are shrinking every day and we're pretty proud of that. After my time at the Pentagon, I served as a squadron commander at Pease International Guard Base. And this is one of the first times that you really get to, as, as a flyer, when you're a squadron commander, serve your airmen. And I tell you, there's no greater joy. 
Uh, I deployed forces all over the world in support of combat operations, humanitarian and air medical evacuation missions, homeland defense missions, and nuclear deterrence operations. What made this tour so special to me was that this was an opportunity that actually had to kind of grow leaders. Uh, and, and, you know, normally in the first 10 years of an aviator's career, you're trying to learn your craft, you're trying to be the best pilot that you ever saw. Uh, and, and you're trying to re be really good instructor pilot and train future pilots, but once you start moving into those key leadership roles, you're being asked to do something a little bit more important, and that's to grow your future leaders. And, and I take a lot of pride in, in, in what, what we did as a squadron. I didn't always get it right, but the beautiful thing about a squadron is that I had about 100 other airmen who helped me, and we helped each other make sure that we can get our mission done, we can grow as a family, and then we can come home. Anyone can be a leader, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, there's been times when you've probably heard that question, are leaders born or made, but I'm here to tell you that anybody can become a leader, and anybody can be thrown into a leadership position, but leading as a servant leader, I will tell you, is quite a bit different. Robert Greenleaf, who first coined the term servant leadership, said, the servant leader is a servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. And notice that he didn't say lead first because there is a difference. Robert Greenleaf understood very, very clearly that the desire to become a leader is someone, someone far different than a servant leader and that the former desires to lead in order to acquire power. I don't, wanna, I don't want those kinds of leaders in my Air Force or my military because that's just not what we need. What we need are, are folks who are looking at each other's needs and leading as a servant first which is why many of us veterans in the room understand the service before self mantra better than anybody else in the world. Yes, you will find those types of folks uh, in society, those that, that want to lead uh, and, and acquire power. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, I will say fortunately, they are few and far between because those who actually are the true servants in the world far outnumber them. And I encourage you, JMers, to lead a life as a servant leader. The choice set before you is being a leader first on one hand and the servant leader on the other. One side will ultimately lead to a life unfulfilled and your subordinates or your teammates will suffer from a lack of development and growth. The other extreme, the servant first, is harder. It takes a lot of work. It requires empathy, radically listening, and a clear understanding of not only your needs, but the needs of those you intend to serve. Greenleaf went on to say this, the difference man itself manifests itself in the care taken by the servant first to make sure that the other people's highest priority needs are being served. And this is the best part. How do you test this? Well, the best test and the most difficult to administer is do those serve, those that you're leading, grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? A servant leader focuses primarily on the growth and well-being of, people, of the people and the communities to which they belong. I try each and every day uh, in my life to lead as a servant leader. It's incredibly hard, and you will fail from time to time. But you got to get back up and maintain focus on the long-term benefits of a servant leadership lifestyle. I challenge each and every one of you in the room, whether you're a student here at JM, a teacher, a parent, or an ex experienced participant of life. That's a nice way of saying old people, okay? Uh, strive to become a servant leader first. The men and women who took the oath to defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, all share that common bond, and that bond is service to others in a profession that is bigger than themselves. But I'm here to tell all of you students that you don't need to put on a uniform to serve your country. You can, take, you can take a personal oath to serve your teammates, your classmates, your community, your country in a variety of ways. And we, and we need this now more than ever, and we're going to need your help and leadership in the future. Don't get me wrong. I'll take each and every one of you back to Fairchild tomorrow. I'm taking the 12 o'clock flight back if anybody wants to go to Spokane. Uh, and I'll get you trained and ready for the Air Force. Uh, because I know there's quite a few of you out there with a lot of talent that we could use. And we need pilots, if you haven't heard. We're a little bit short. So I'll take every one of you that uh, wants to fly an airplane into our Air Force 
and uh, gladly put you in a flight suit, and, and I guarantee you're going to have the time of your life. That's my shameless plug, folks. Uh, but uh, uh, I do want to tell you, though, that I've lived, lived an incredible life, and I'm thankful for having the opportunity to serve this great nation and to stand side by side with veterans that are here today. If you take one thing away from my talk today, I want you to remember this. The servant leader shares power, puts the needs of others first, and helps people develop and perform at the highest possible level. This is the life we are all looking for, and I know because you are students of John Marshall that you will be the ones to make a difference. That phrase, mark, mark of excellence, that you see on the logo, it's been there forever, and it's not some fancy hashtag or something to be taken lightly. It defines how we as students and alumni should live our lives. Jammers, you are tomorrow's servant leaders, involved members of our global community who make me and other veterans in this room proud of the oath we've taken and the sacrifices we've made for America. So thank you veterans for inspiring me to serve. Thank you to all of you jammers for being present with me today. And I wish you all continued success in the future and a joyful life. Thank you, John Marshall, lead on. Thank you, Colonel Heathman, for traveling to be here with us today and for sharing your story and thoughts. We genuinely appreciate your service to this country, as well as the many personal sacrifices you and your family have made in order to make your service possible. As a member of our Rocket family, you are demonstrating JM's excellence each and every day, and we are proud to call you one of our own. Once a Rocket, always a Rocket. In our 2016 salute, we talked about the importance of Gold Star families. A Gold Star family is an American family who has lost a loved one during the, service, the performance of their military service. They share this loss with their community by hanging a flag in the window of their family's home. A Gold Star on a red background. Created in 1928 by mothers who lost their sons in World War I, the Gold Star flag is still in use today. Also in our 2016 program, we were privileged to be able to share the story of one John Marshall Gold Star family. John Marshall, 1967 graduate, Donnie Gertis, a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps, was killed in action almost one year to the day he graduated after volunteering to take the place of a fellow Marine who had fallen ill. While walking point for this mission, Lance Corporal Gertis was killed in action by putting a fellow Marine's needs before his own Lance Corporal Gertis demonstrated service before self, making the ultimate sacrifice. Sadly, Lance Corporal Gertis was not the only John Marshall graduate who gave his life serving his country during the Vietnam War in 1968. Another young man, Marine Corporal Paul Allen, gave his life just nine weeks before Lance Corporal Gertis was killed in action. Today, our special guests and member of the Paul Allen family will share their Gold Star family story with you. At this time, we would like to introduce John Marshall Sr., Taya Lee, and her sister, Specialist Brianna Lee. We are honored to have them share this very personal story about their great uncle, Marine Corporal Paul Allen, with you. We are proud to be here today to share the story of our great uncle, Paul Allen. Sharing his story with all of you is a way for our family to continue to honor and remember him. Marine Corporal Paul Allen was a 1965 JM graduate. Like so many of us here today, he knew what it meant to be a part of this wonderful JM family. Uncle Paul grew up in Woodstock, Illinois, and knew from an early age that he was part of a family who valued service in the United States Armed Forces. His father and his uncle both served during World War II, so it was natural that he would want to serve someday as well. One funny story our family enjoys sharing with others is the day Paul made friends with, with visiting U.S. Navy sailors at church. Hoping to spend more time with them, he hopped on his bicycle and pedaled 30 miles to the Great Lakes Naval Base near Chicago. I know, who just up and bikes 30 miles? Although it may have been an exciting adventure for him, he unfortunately forgot to tell his mom where he was going for the day, and you can probably imagine how that went over. During his high school years, he moved to Rochester and enrolled at JM. 
Just like so many of you here today, he parked his car in the same lot we use. He walked and talked and laughed with friends in the same halls. He worked out in our gym. He sat and studied hard and listened in our classrooms. He cheered fellow Rockets in the stadium, took in theater shows and concerts in this very auditorium, ran on the track team, and his personal favorite, attended school dances. Paul was like a lot of guys. He loved fast cars. He drove them, repaired them, polished them, and souped them up. Here at GM, he was quite well known for his 1963 Chevy Impala and 1965 Mustang. Even as a student, great uncle Paul liked to help others. Many of his friends still recall how they got excused from classes here one day in order to help fill sandbags in Winona during a flood. He must have been driving his 63 Impala because they made the 60 mile trip in 30 minutes. Great Uncle Paul graduated from JM in June of 1965 and promptly enlisted in the Marine Corps. After basic training, he was assigned to advanced training and aviation mechanics, a job he truly loved and excelled at. Paul's girlfriend, Mary, however, was still a student here at JM. Unwilling to miss a dance with his girlfriend, he made a special trip home in the fall of 1966 in order to take her to the homecoming dance. His family remembers how proud he was to wear his United States Marine Corps uniform. It wasn't until the spring of 1967 that Corporal Paul Allen shipped out to the Marine base in Quezon in South Vietnam in order to, jo to join a Huey helicopter gunship squadron as a new military offensive was getting underway, the Tet Offensive. Paul's hard work, focus, and skill as a mechanic on the gunships was quickly noted and rewarded. Promoted to crew chief, he was now responsible for all things mechanical on board the aircraft and had the final say as to if and when the ship would fly. Paul did not take that responsibility lightly. The Huey and its crew were designated as a resupply aircraft for grounded forces, as well as providing artillery defense for medical evacuation choppers in the mountainous area of Quezon. In a unique twist of timing, another JM grad, Corporal Donnie Gerdes, whose story we heard earlier, was part of the ground forces in the Quezon area as well. It is an interesting coincidence that two JM grads were so close to each other in such a dangerous place. And a devastating turn of events that both would lose their lives within two months of each other in Quezon. During his time in the Quezon area, Corporal Paul Allen received a citation for meritorious achievement as crew chief during combat support missions. The citation made special note that his courage and devotion to duty in the face of hazardous flying conditions were in keeping with the highest tradition of the United States Naval Service. On April 9, 1968, in a letter home, Paul wrote that he had just finished putting a new tail rotor on his Huey and that he looked forward to seeing the month of July come when his tour of Vietnam duty would be up because life in Quezon could really get you down. Great Uncle Paul was excited to finally be coming home soon. Sadly, Uncle Paul never saw July and that letter would be his last. Just two days later, on April 11, 1968, Corporal Paul Allen's Huey, which was escorting two medical evacuation choppers flying wounded soldiers out of Quezon, collided with the lead evacuation helicopter. Our uncle and 11 other Marines died instantly. Three days later, two Marines rang the Allen family's doorbell and our lives were irrevocably changed. Grief over the loss of our beloved family member and the public controversy at the time over America's involvement in the Vietnam War kept our family's memories and pain private. It is only in recent years that we, as a family, have been able to speak publicly about Paul, his service, and his sacrifice. He died trying to protect those who were wounded, and we are so proud of him for trying to keep him safe. Yet we find we miss him every day and wonder how he would have continued to grow and change over the years. What might he have accomplished? We wonder how our lives would have been different had he been able to share these past years with us. Knowing what we do of Paul, we are certain of our of lives and those who had yet to meet him would have been enriched by his presence. Thank you for allowing us to share his story today. At this time, we wish to thank the family of Corporal Paul Allen. Thank you for your willingness to share your family's story with us, for your courage in the great face of great loss and pain, and for your sacrifice on behalf of all of us. He truly lived his life demonstrating service before self. 
Would members of the Paul Allen family please stand so we may recognize, thank, and honor each of you. In keeping with the spirit of service, John Marshall's American Studies students in 2013 and 14 raised over $50,000 to support the raising and training of two service dogs through the Warrior Canine Connection program. Warrior Canine Connection enlists the help of veterans to train its service dogs. Veterans on the training team may themselves suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and or traumatic brain injuries. Despite their own recovery challenges, veterans on these teams view this as personal responsibility to give back to their brothers and sisters in arms. By helping someone with a greater need than their own, they are making progress in their own healing. In the spring of 2014, the Valor Litter was born and JM was invited to name two puppies. In, tradi in tradition of the Warrior Canine Connection, the dogs always bear the name of a service person who was wounded or gave his or her life as a member of the United States military. JM students decide to honor our two Gold Star families, the Gerdes and the Allen families. One dog was named Paul for Corporal Paul Allen, and the other one was named Donnie for Lance Corporal Donnie Gerdes. In a wonderful service before self-connection, the caregiver for the puppy Paul, Miss Kyra Coffey, said that caring for and raising puppy Paul was her own way to give back. As a military veteran herself, she felt she had been spared the physical and mental traumas that many of her fellow veterans faced and believed it was only right that she could do all she could to help her fellow veterans. After extensive training, both dogs are deemed best suited for service as military support dogs for military families. Currently, Donnie is working as a therapy dog alongside a healthcare professional and Paul is serving his military forever family as a beloved family pet. Up next, we have video messages from two of Puppy Paul's favorite humans, Ms. Kyra Coffey, a military veteran who raised and trained him, and Rachel Schmidt, a member of his new forever family. Hi, John Marshall High School. I'm Kyra, and I was the puppy parent of Paul. Paul was a wacky, crazy, funny, beautiful dog, and my time with him were some of the most memorable. I visited JMHS three years ago with Paul, and I can't thank the students and Paul Allen's family enough for allowing us to come and meet everyone. Paul is living a different path than we all intended, but I want everyone to know that Paul's impact is enormous. Paul's training put him in contact with veterans who needed physical, mental, and emotional healing, and I can assure you that this cuddlebug sweetheart was always up to the task. He just loves everyone and everything. And sometimes just having a dog you can hug and kiss and who immediately loves you back is the perfect remedy to whatever ails you. JMHS, I will never be able to express how wonderful your selflessness meant to me, WCC, Paul's parents, and Paul himself. He continues the memory of Paul Allen and all of that began with you and your service before self. Thank you, Rockets. Greetings, Rockets, and the entire John Marshall High School community. I am Rachel Schmidt, and along with my husband Jim, are the proud parents to Paul. A special hello to the family of Paul Allen, whose sacrifice to our country is honored by our dog Paul, wearing every Veterans Day a Marine bandana. The training that Paul received will forever be a part of what makes him a great dog. He has the best manners, except for when a piece of food drops to the ground. He is extremely laid back and loves long naps on our bed. Eating is by far his greatest joy and has an uncanny ability to catch a small biscuit from across the room. 
He is quite the cuddler and responds well to his belly being scratched. He's a mama's boy, mainly due to the fact that mama's usually in the kitchen. He has never met a stranger and happily greets people whether they want to meet him or not. We live amongst a large university and many college kids come up to give him a hug and a kiss and have a moment of puppy love. We are all indeed blessed to have Paul in our lives. Wasn't it great to check in with our John Marshall puppy family? In the very best service before self, we have seen today how veterans have sacrificed for their country and continue to put service before self into practice even in their post-military lives. During this week leading up to Veterans Day, we ask you to take the examples of our veterans and Corporal Paul Allen and think about ways that in, which, in your own way you can cross that line, your own personal Rubicon and commit to being of service to others whenever you can. How can you demonstrate service before self? Perhaps you could volunteer to help out Mr. Komanecki, who heads up our local hometown gratitude program here in Rochester, which has sent over 18,000 care packages since 2005 to deployed servicemen and women all over the world. This year, hometown gratitude is sending packages to three locations, Afghanistan, Honduras, and a combat support hospital in Kuwait. Or perhaps you can offer to help neighbors with tasks around their homes which are too difficult for them to do by themselves. This might include raking, mowing, clearing flower beds and gardens, or even shoveling when the snow flies. Each year students in the American Studies class choose a new spirit of service project, much as they did with the Warrior Canine Connection organization. And we are excited to share their new project with you today. This year, they're making it their mission to provide a home-cooked dinner to each veteran staying in an area veteran's home or VA hospital this Thanksgiving. They, f they hope to feed over 2,000 veterans, their families, and staff in a variety of locations in Minneapolis, La Crescent, St. Cloud, and Toma, Wisconsin. Today, American Studies students will be outside the auditorium following the assembly with special buttons which honor our veterans. We invite all veterans to please take a button as a thank you for your service to our country. All others are welcome to purchase bracelets, buttons, and various items to assist in our fundraising efforts for our Thanksgiving meals for veterans. American Studies students will also be hosting Slices for Soldiers, Feed Our Vets, Pizza Feed on Thursday, November 8th in the JM Cafeteria from 5 to 7 p.m. Free donations will be accepted. In addition to food, there will be silent auction items and various drawings throughout the evening. All are welcome and encouraged to attend. Service before self is just another way to carry on the tradition of excellence here at John Marshall. Excellent in, excellence in academics and excellence in community service. And now, in order to pay quiet respect in honor of those who have chosen to serve our country, we ask for a moment of silence. We encourage you to say thank you to a veteran, shake their hand, and let them know you appreciate them and their service. Our next video postcard comes from a 2009 John Marshall graduate who is currently deployed in the Middle East. Most people don't realize the US military has teams of sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines who are trained in, spe in spe spe specialized trades, excuse me, carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. These units are located stateside and anywhere in the world the United States military goes. Minnesota Army National Guard Specialist Nathan Polanski graduated from JM in 2009. While in high school, he loved sports, being part of te a team, and all the action team sports provided. Nate played varsity football, hockey, baseball, and somewhere in there, a year of varsity tennis. Nam's favorite Nate's favorite JM class, sports biology. After high school, Nate tried college for a bit, then decided to list in the Army National Guard in January 2010. 
Nate scored high on the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, the ASVAB test, which is used to determine qualification for enlistment into the armed forces. Nate's high ASVAB score and being the distinguished honor graduate from his advanced training allowed Nate for his top choice for a job. He became part of a specialized cross-trained construction engineers unit made up of carpenters, electricians, and plumbers. Over the past eight years, Specialist Polanski has trained and served with several units. Last spring, he volunteered to deploy with the 851st out of central Minnesota. He is currently deployed on a special forces compound somewhere in the Middle East. Hey John Marshall, Special Nathan Polanski here. My team and I are attached to the 851st Vertical Engineers based out of Camp Ripley. Our team is comprised of electricians, plumbers, and carpenters. We're about 8 to 15 men deep and we're spread out all over the Middle East. When it comes down to teamwork, it's crucial to getting the job done with us having such a small group of guys. But I got my start being part of a team back when I played for the hockey, football, baseball, and tennis teams at John Marshall. But we rely on each other's individual goals and talents to get that efficient accomplished safely and efficiently. But thank you, JM, for all you do for us veterans out here and the one wavering support you give us. Cool. If you ask Specialist Polanski what he misses most about being overseas, he answers, my Twins game partner, my son. Specialist Polanski will return next spring to Minnesota and his job at Mayo Clinic where he works in a pharmaceutical lab. He will continue his service to our country in the Minnesota Army National Guard and hopefully be back in time to coach his son's t-ball team. In closing today, we say a heartfelt thank you to all of our guests. We are so glad you could be here with us today, and we wish you all safe travels. We would also like to recognize and extend a special thank you to today to Rochester's branch of Disabled Veterans for supporting our program today. As well as those individuals now listed on the screen who contributed their time and talents to making this 2018 Salute to Veterans program possible. As we wrap up today's John Marshall Salute to Veterans program, we have one more very short video postcard. Specialist Nate Polanski and his engineer team just have one more thing to say to all of us. Go Rockets! Oh! Hey, wait. Can we see that again? Go Rockets! Oh! Thank you, JM. Take it away, Mr. Soderbergh Chase and the JM Band.